I am so glad that you are here to join us. This is so exciting. My name is Alice Santos. I am part of the staff here at Small Press Expo, and we are here with Coco Fox, Shingyan Kaur, Isabella Rotman, and Kevin J. Stanton to talk about cardamancy. <laughs> So the form of cardamancy that most people are familiar with is tarot. However, that is not the end of it. There are many, many ways to perform these same things using different types of decks, be it Oracle decks, Lenormand decks. Doesn't even have to be any of those formats. And so I was really interested in the ways that the creation of sequential art worked with the creation of those tools and these amazing people are here to talk about that with me. So let's, if we could, let's start with Coco. If you could just tell me about your work and about the deck that we're gonna be talking about today. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm Coco Fox, I'm a cartoonist, and uh, a lot of my work is for kids and about science or magic, and my deck is specifically kind of an all ages spirit deck inspired by tarot. So uh, you'll like notice a couple things from maybe the Rider Waite stuff, but it's uh, you also might pull like a sandwich or something like that. <laughs> so you never know. It's filled with puns and it's that kind of vibe. So tarot for people who are, might be like a little bit afraid of tarot. That's cool. Hi, I'm Sheng Yan Kaur, and I'm usually one of those people who's a little afraid of tarot. Um, I'm a cartoonist and an artist, and I'm usually more inclined towards like weird divination, like strange other divination rituals. And doing this tarot deck was actually kind of my way of pulling myself out of like a two-year non-drawing slump. Yeah. Like I had a book come out, and I was like, I can't draw anymore. Uh, and so, you know, drawing 78 cards was actually a really good uh, workout to kind of get me back to drawing. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm Isabella. My deck is uh, This Might Hurt Tarot, which is like a modernized version of Rider Wade Smith, which you guys are all probably familiar with. But I was looking at the time for a tarot deck that was like, I both was into the art and it didn't have all of the like connotations of the medievalness of Rider Waite, but still was like close enough to the symbolism that I didn't like need to learn a whole new thing to read it. Um, and yeah, outside of that, I'm a cartoonist. I make like little zines about my problems or, <laughs> <laughs> or sex ed, one or the other. <laughs> Um, my name is Kevin J. Stanton. I'm primarily an illustrator. Uh, my deck is Botanica Tarot, which is um, kind of loosely based in Waite Smith, but it is um, about the language of flowers. Amazing. Thanks, y'all. So at first glance, I think that the connection between cardamancy and comics uh, can seem a little odd, but one of the things that strikes me about it is the idea of sequences. Tarot inherently, particularly in the major arcana, has a sequence. That sequence is disrupted when you shuffle cards, but then you make a new one when you deal them. And so thinking about those sequences and sequential art in and of itself, I think is really cool. So I'd love to hear more about how cycles and sequences show up in your work and what that shows up in, in your creative process. Go for it. <laughs> oh, um, uh, it's kind of weird when you make something uh, for people who might not be used to tarot. So I'd say that more of mine is like, it's in alphabetical order just to make it sort of easier. But um, sequencing as far as uh, the readings, is that what you mean? Like it, past, it, present, Yeah, future? whatever, yeah, however it shows up for you. Um, I love, uh, personally when I read, I do a past, present, future, um, but yeah, I find, I find that works really well for me with this deck. Nice. I did want to pull up one of the things that I find really charming. So these are two different depictions of the fool. The one on the left is from uh, Botanica. The one on the right is from This Might Hurt. And showcases just one of the incredible aspects of tarot is that these same general uh, idea or concept or archetype can be depicted in a million different ways. So, yeah, um, would you be able to tell us? Uh, let's start with Izzy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I, I don't know how familiar with tarot everyone in the audience is, so forgive me if I'm telling you lots of things you already know. But um, for me, the major arcana, and I think it's pretty universally understood as this, is a story of the fool's like progression through life. So he's the protagonist and kind of a stand-in for you, and then like every other card is like a person he meets or an experience that he has. So I think of all of it as like this big story, which is cool because that's a comic. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that. And then, yeah, usually when I read, I like to just pull three cards and not do a spread and just sort of like see what little story I can make out of it and then pull more clarifiers on top of that. Um, but yeah, in my deck in particular, like the world is just my world. Um, People have, people have complimented the deck on like its diversity, but for the most part, it's like, yeah, I'm just drawing my friends. Like a lot of these are like real people and that's probably why it actually like looks like real people. So yeah, it's like this character going through things. And in the majors, there's magic and in the minors, there's not magic. And that's, that's how it works. Very cool. Yeah. Ching, what do you think about how? How sequences show up? Um, yeah, I mean, I use tarot reading often as a storytelling device. Um, so literally, I use them as a sequential, like comic, sequential storytelling. I mean, That's comics so cool. and and tarot decks, like you're just trying to tell a story, even when you're reading it. Um, in my deck, I have a couple of fairly intentional sequences. Like they're actually, I, don't, I did not send you these images, but they're <laughs> and only like four of you can see it. <laughs> but they're essentially like paired cards, like the Empress and the Emperor make up a single oh. image. Um, and so do the sun, the moon, I'm trying to like connect their tails, they're all strange little animals. Uh, and the sun, moon, and star also connect into a single sequence. That's and so, cool. so these three kind of tell a story of like basically night and day. Um, but, oh my God, I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, but yeah, I mean, tarot, Tarot, our tarot reading is just like a sequential form to me. So yeah. they, I don't really think of them as separate <laughs> at all. Yeah, definitely. I, I similarly, definitely. I think realized um, when I was making a deck and then also reading with uh, other cards for other people, um, it was maybe one of the first times I was like, oh, these are pieces of a story and it's up to me to tell it, mm -hmm. and that I'd never really been in that position before, but it was really interesting to kind of think like, I usually do a 10 card spread for people, and then um, you know, you, you as the, the reader are like, oh, okay, well that's maybe not the, the best card, but like trying to think of it in context, and then when you've made the deck two, you're thinking about all the additional context that you put on it, that you're reading for somebody else. Um, and it's a really fascinating way to basically tell a different story every time, both for um, you know the cards that you read, but also uh, the person you're reading for at something new every time. It's, it's, it's really genuinely fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, and on that note, another thing that I find very interesting, I hope other people do too, is the world building mm -hmm. that goes on with a deck. And, sort of the the symbols you use, the language, so to speak, that, you know, that is throughout these cards. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Shing, actually, let me pull okay. up some of that, if maybe you'd, yeah, you'd like totally. to tell us about it. Um, I mean, my deck is very rooted in, I mean, Strange Beast is called the Strange Beast tar Tarot. Um, so it already has this element of just absurd fantasy to it but I wanted it to be very rooted in my life. I mean, a, a large portion of why I made this deck was because I wanted a deck that was mine, that truly mm -hmm. resonated with me and all the strange things that I collected in my life. Um, so the different suits uh, that, I, that I have all reflect actual things, like um, the suit of swords most often appears as like actual kitchen knives. Um, and needles, that's a, yeah. So I've got needles as swords, I've got knives as swords. Uh, my wands are, I've got matchsticks. I've even got a card with like little paper umbrellas for those are <laughs> wands. Um, and coins, I've got sand dollars. Mm -hmm. And cups for me are actual cups, most often like actual teacups, because that's what I think of most when I use a cup. But also just bottles and other, other sorts of vessels. So 
I've got one element of that world building that's just very, uh, very personal, very rooted in real objects. Um, and then everything else is just kind of these strange, wild creatures that I've been drawing for like 20 years. Um, and there's both those creatures, obviously some of them are based on real animals, like the fool is based on my own dog, Bug. Mm -hmm. um, my fool is mostly like just a dog, so it's kind of like based on the Rider Waite tarot, but just, just a little dude. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, so it's kind of a mashup of things that are personal to me and also all this like absurdist like fantasy world building that I've been doing for, for over a decade now. <laughs> Did you find that that process was different between creating specifically sequential art or like the creation of a deck? Did that framework change how you thought about that? Um, yeah, it actually almost felt more liberating to do a tarot deck because I could leave interpretations open to the audience. Like I did, I am a storyteller, but I did not have to be the storyteller. Mm. So making a tarot deck is sort of, I mean, it's collaborative storytelling where I only need to tell part of the story and the rest of it is in the audience's hands. I mean, the, the reader's hands. While in comics, it's kind of like, you know, you're sort of delivering a story on a platter. Like, this is a story I told, this is my story. <laughs> While building a tarot deck is kind of more like, this is our story. So, kind of, That's so it's a little easier. But you only have to do half the writing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, Coco, I would love to hear your input. Let me flip to uh, these little, these little friends. Those I want to hear ghouls. about the world that they live in. <laughs> um, so these are called Little Ghouls. Uh, my book is The Little Ghoul's Fortune Telling Cards and Scene. Um, and I definitely wrote this as a love letter to children's theater because I, I liked the idea that everything was sort of a physical um, object in the world and almost like little sets. So the idea being that this is kind of a, a role you're playing today. Like, I want it to feel really playful. So every costume and outfit could be an actual Halloween uh, costume. <laughs> uh, and, and you could actually be in those places. That was super important to me. And then um, there's a large variety of kinds of kids in these, but um, mostly uh, my favorite part of reading this deck is like reading it with children because they, they have their own version of what every card means. And that exactly what you were saying. It's like, I just kind of set you up to make all your own jokes and also all your own uh, interpretations of the cards. But um, yeah, and it comes with a pun-filled book of what each card means. But I, I definitely found like, um, it should be really playful on every page. Yeah, that was my. It's that's also the world. very encouraging. Mm. I forget which one it is. Good. It was like the corn one that was like, not everyone has to like you, and that's okay. Oh, <laughs> that's, I'm obsessed that's with the, the corn the, card. The shark. The it's like shark. The shark. Yeah. Yeah. I got to obsess. My nephew was like, can you make sure there are enough boys in your deck? Which I, I thought oh. was like kind of funny because like, okay, I get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of only drawing witches for like. <laughs> four years, um, but he wanted shark, and then he was like, but don't make it mean, like make it a nice shark. And so it's like a card about when you're going through personal growth, sometimes um, not everyone will keep swimming with you. Aww. And so like, that's actually a good thing because then everyone that's left with you on the beach is there for you for this like new chapter, Aww. which, you know, Aww. plus some like shark teeth puns rolled in there. But. <laughs> And also, you can eat people sometimes. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, oh, thanks. Please. I love it. <laughs> and Kevin, your interaction with these cards, um, you you have so much to tell us about this, so I'm going to leave this one up to you. <laughs> I, I would say my world building is, at least for the deck as it currently exists and not the expansion I'm working on, but um, is very grounded in our world, um, in, like, the world, I guess. Um, so I did a lot of research on Victorian flower language uh, called floriography, but I also, um, I added a lot of interpretations um, based on plant behaviors or, um, you know, in some cases, uh, there's purple saxifrage is the 
um, the plant that flowers at the highest uh, latitude of the world, and so it is a card about like flourishing in the face of resilience and that kind of interpretation. And for the suit objects, similar to Shing's actually, um, there are a lot of, I think only a couple of them are the traditional Waitsmith symbols of the, the suits. The rest of them are um, lossy cups for the, the Eight of Cups because the plant is aconite and, um, you know, using um, clubs for some of the wands or maces for some of the wands, like really trying to be open to um, interesting interpretations of real objects and um, similar with storytelling, thinking about how um, these plants, usually I try to find like where they're native to and then use objects that represent that space and the people who uh, either originally lived there or used that plant the most or, and it, it was a really fascinating way to um, both explore how important plants are to humans and have been for our entire existence, um, but then also learned a lot of weird stuff along the way too. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned the expansion actually, would you mind telling us a little bit more about sure. that? Let me get my slides in order, here we go. Um, yes, I'm working on um, a 33 card Oracle deck expansion. It's three new suits, um, and they're all about how plants interact with animals. Um, so the suits are pollinators, uh, nectar robbers, and seed carriers. And so each suit is sort of loosely uh, exploring those relationships, um, which has also been really interesting because our world is so strange and there are one of the, the cards is about, I don't think it's one of these, um, but I, there's a, a shrike, a bird, um, that literally, uh, it eats a lizard that eats the berries of this one plant. It's called Diplo, Diplo endozucori. It's a seed carrier that has been passed through two different animals. Um, and uh, it actually impales the lizard on the thorns of the berry tree that it eats as well, which was a, a fascinating um, <laughs> thing to learn. <laughs> happens uh, pretty often, um, but I, I, loved, I, I, I love finding out. Uh, there's another card that is about, um, it's, there's a, a seafaring bird that nests in this one tree, and the way it spreads its seeds is they are sticky and they, attached to the bird, um, but they often attach too many and it actually kills the birds at the base of the tree, which also fuels the tree, <laughs> keeps it going. Um, but they also nest in the tree, so it's, uh, I, it was really fascinating to do a lot more research about our yeah, world. Um, for sure. Nature is extremely metal yeah, when I'm, you think I'm about so it. excited to be able so to, <laughs> to share like the weird things um, that, that, that do really happen um, around us, which was cool. Amazing. Yeah. I love, I'm so, it, like, I am fangirling out about this. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Isabella, so um, when we're thinking about symbols, I would love to hear um, more from you about not just this might hurt, but this might help. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk about it. So I got to do an Oracle deck as part of the like special limited edition that my publisher put out of the tarot deck. So unfortunately, you like have to get it with the tarot deck. But um, mm. so the concept of it is I took a symbol from the card and like isolated that symbol. So in this comparison here, we see strength and like you know, the, the very um, Cliff Notes version of strength is it's about like you are both the girl and the lion and you are taming the darker parts of yourself through compassion. Um, so the, the object I chose to isolate from this was the garland. So this is like the, the way in which you are choosing to be gentle, like the, um, the practices you put forth to like actually do that like compassion work instead of just the concept of like do it mm -hmm. and it was really fun I ended up doing one for each um, major and then like three for each suit because it was a smaller deck and it was really fun to like go through each card and be like okay what is this this thing this one and I, I say symbols but I mean objects or animals and like if we take it out of the greater context but we're still thinking of it as like part of that scene what does it mean 
I it's love fun. it. And it's really fun. So I you can it. use it as like a clarifier. Yeah. So temperance. Temperance is about combining opposites or like taking sort of the middle option. Sometimes it's like telling you that you're thinking of things as binary options, but there's actually a third option. Um, so from temperance, I pulled, if you look behind temperance's knee, there's a middle path with a crown over it. And that's this idea of take the middle path. And so that's what I isolated there. So temperance has like all of these meanings, but that oracle card just has that one meaning of take the middle path. That's so cool. And it was very fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> Full disclosure, this is my regular clarifier oh, deck. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, just some of those things that show up among the suits and the court cards. Yeah, thank you. So the big thing, the, the big guiding principle with like my world building is I was trying to make everything more relatable from wider, rider weight. And um, for the courts, I used all real people in my life. And they show up in some of the minors too. But yeah, so the, um, the people I chose for each court card I wanted them like in how I thought of their personality to reflect what the card is an archetype of. And I know that humans aren't archetypes, but just sort of part of who they are. So like going down the line, the Queen of Pentacles is my friend. The Queen of Swords is Beth Hetland, who some of you might know, she's a cartoonist. Yes. <laughs> um, the Queen of Wands is also a cartoonist, Marnie Calloway. <laughs> and that's actually her cat. Um, the Queen of Wands card always has a black cat, and I just got so lucky Aww. that my friend who I chose has a black cat. <laughs> and then the Queen of Cups is my mom. Um, yeah. So all of these people like reflect the things that I love about these queens as archetypes. Like um, the Queen of Cups is usually a person who is very empathetic and intuitive and guided by emotion, and my mom is very empathetic and intuitive and always like knows things. And yeah. Marnie is always very inspiring and caring, and Beth will always stand up for you. And uh, Selena, the Queen of Pentacles, is just one of those people who's good at everything, <laughs> and you don't know how she does it. <laughs> Amazing. So I have to ask, I've been noticing this. Are you all just looking at cards for notes, or are you just like doing five card pulls in the <laughs> middle of the panel? <laughs> looking at what are notes. you talking about also looking at everyone's else's cards. Yeah. i was <laughs> like i'm sorry it's a very distracting no panel. i am fascinated i'm like what, what i was gonna that? hold i had some things i want to talk about and i was gonna hold certain cards up mm. as examples but i don't think anyone can see this <laughs> yeah it's okay i was just like wow you're <laughs> really getting into this <laughs> we're just <laughs> cardamancy so like, i don't know the SPS. answer please give me the answer <laughs> tell me what to say <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, cool. I think if folks are okay with it, we're going to open things up to a little bit of a Q&A before we wrap up. So um, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask our panelists, if you could just step over to the microphone or hold your hand up, and we'll be able to bring it over to you. Yeah. So we have someone over here. Oh, no, you're good. I wasn't sure if someone was bringing the mic over. Um, my question is, was there any particular uh, suit or major arcana that was challenging for you as an artist to design or make? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was yours? Uh, coins. I found coins really challenging. Um, and I think part of it is because I wanted all my cards, um, I wanted all the suits in my cards to be diegetic in terms of how, like all, all my creatures are interacting with the objects. Um, and coins just was really challenging for me. Like it's you know fairly easy to kind of be like, I am getting stabbed by a sword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am holding a wand. Um, but even like with reinterpreting um, pentacles as, uh, and using coins instead of pentacles um, and then reinterpreting coins as like sand dollars and sometimes actual, I just found actual coins really difficult to integrate. Um, they're too small. They're too, too small. small. <laughs> they're, they're just not the right, like practically speaking, they're what? just not the right size. Unless you're doing um, and they're the right size. <laughs> but like, <laughs> emotionally yes. speaking, swords was hard. I was gonna say, so coins swords. was probably the easiest yeah. for me because I could play with the size and they were 
when I was like, oh, this plane is from here, this they used these coins. I was going to you know? say, but Kevin, flowers are also small. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whereas I found, uh, I think I probably found wands the hardest to choose because huh. um, we don't live in a fantasy realm. And so picking, uh, like trying to interpret what a wand would be that's not a sword, that doesn't fit into the same like weaponry thing that a, a sword would, um, I, I, I found a, a hard one. I'd love to hear how everyone, like, what everyone's parameter for what a wand was. I got for lots of sticks. Sticks. Yeah. <laughs> lots of sticks. I, I did any wooden tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, with one exception of, I think there's a, a metal mace. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But okay. yeah, mostly, like, there's a maypole for the ace and, um, like, spinning rods cool. for the, the four. Yeah. 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 Huh. yeah, mine was wooden implement of a mm -hmm. certain... <laughs> Blunt. <laughs> Blunt wooden <laughs> implement of a certain length and shape. Yeah, where this... Yeah. 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 I, I found it hard to do um, the cards I don't like or relate to. Uh, yeah. So that would be the emperor and the hierophant. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I like them more in the process of the struggle. Oh, I similarly like doing the tower. I was yeah. so... Um, I was like, oh, I, I don't want to draw this card, like, ever. <laughs> and yet, the tower and death in my deck are probably my favorite majors. Yeah. And I was like, why did I make this one so nice? <laughs> <laughs> why did I paint this so well? Death is in here. Let me just scroll back to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. There's the death is um, yeah. it's a pine tree that needs wildfires to spread its seeds. So it is about oh. cycles. That's so good. That's so good. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Uh, next question, please. Uh, part of the thing that I really like about tarot and other cards is that there's a very tactile experience of it. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the bringing these into into being physical cards that you use. What with the design, you know, what parts of that you had control over, and uh, you know, the packaging and everything that you went about doing oh, designing that. Well, I think everyone but Kevin self-published. Right. Yeah, I self-published the majors. Oh, you did? Um, and then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I self-published, so I got to do everything. Yeah. <laughs> but I do love just sort of conceptually that I got to make a tool instead of, like, just art. I mean, mm. art is art is wonderful, but it was very cool. It's like, oh, I've made a thing that has a functional purpose and will be used that way, yeah. and I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, I love texture. Like this tarot, I mean, I did self-publish, but I did feel somewhat limited by the options, like by the printing options you generally have at producing something at this scale. Um, if you look at my other work, it's all in like nubby watercolor paper. It has a very like tactile, like heaviness, textural element. Um, and I was able to get that with the box that's like fabric covered. It's kind of yeah. shiny. So I got a little bit of that in. Um, and, I, and I do like the way the cards turned out. Like they've got like a nice weight to them. Um, but if I had more, more of my own way, it would be... Uh, you know, beautiful and hand screen printed and lots of like lovely little weird edges and also be impossible to read and cost $400. So I think where I arrived was fine. <laughs> um, I definitely wanted mine to be really tactile and silly the whole time. So like uh, the little drawstring bag, it just feels different than the cards that feel different than the book. I wanted like an uncoded um, thing for the book, but my favorite was designing the little deck it came in. I wanted the cards to be really easily shuffleable instead of that kind where you like try and shuffle and it all just kind of mm. disappears. But uh, my favorite little uh, thing that I only got because it was self-published was right when you open the deck, it says, magic time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so good. That's so funny. <laughs> so that's fine. Uh, yeah, I Beehive Books published Botanica um, as a full set. Um, but luckily, um, I, I had a lot of control over. Um, and then I was l also lucky to have Maya Delavu, who is so wonderful and obsessive about details that um, she was able to like bring a lot of my vision. She would, I think if I had published it, it would not be as nice as it is, 
she was the one who was like, what if we print it on the inside of the box? And I was like, I, okay. yes. I mean, I didn't even know that was an option, but OK. Um, the packaging yeah. is so beautiful. It's the gorgeous. Mile, yeah. yeah, sort it's of incredible. turned it, turned it on. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, another thing that I was able to get away with my pack packaging. So I really want it to look like your friend was just doodling on it with a gold <laughs> marker. Mm, um, yes. And I think I, I got that. <laughs> it looks very scrawled on. <laughs> It looks great. It looks great. Beautiful. So good. Love it. Can take the next question, please. I just need a moment to fangirl. I backed the beehive on Patreon. Thank I followed you. everything, <laughs> and then um, it's so beautiful. I didn't Thank use so it. Much. Oh yeah. My yes. friend <laughs> flew in and said, "My tarot deck says you need to introduce yourself to your tarot deck." We're sitting down right now. <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." I um, hope it isn't as rude to you as it was to no, me. No, it's so I gentle. Didn't <laughs> she didn't ask. I was like, oh, "We're just gonna be friends. It's fine." But no, it's a wonderful deck to work with. Thank so you thank so you. much. Um, but on the, this is a friend who like, we've had ghosts pop up that we both recognized and felt in a room. And mm. tarot deck, I feel like there's a, a wave of spiritual awareness that's coming back into main culture. And I love that. So I'd love for you guys to speak about the experience of like, I'm a comic book artist or I illustrate and I'm doing a tarot deck. Because those are two different worlds that you're walking in between. I'd love to hear how you did that. Mm. Um, for me, I, I, I've always wanted to make a tarot deck, um, and I have had a lifetime obsessed with symbolism, um, and also a lifetime obsessed with plants, so um, I tried to make two decks prior to this and lost interest in them after three cards, I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think I made it through the first card in the second attempt, um, because in the end, all I really wanted to do was illustrate plants um, and uh, like let myself you know actually do the the art I wanted to make um, but finding um, I don't know in a way like I really found my voice through making Botanica um, and it's been really lovely to similar to what you were saying Shing about like the what people bring to the way they use the deck it's been really wonderful to hear kind of a, a through line of people <laughs> saying that Botanica is gentle but very blunt at the same time <laughs> and it's because I think when I was writing the booklet like that is what I I most needed um, was uh, <laughs> a friend who was going to be like <laughs> so we've made some mistakes along the way <laughs> but we're here now and um, you know this is like what we're gonna do about it and so it's been really wonderful to hear that and I think on a spiritual level in a lot of ways it's it's nice to hear like, yeah, the, th the thing I needed to hear is, it was not, not intentional, I don't think, but that is what comes through in a lot of uh, readings, which is very special. Yeah, one of the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I just wanted to respond to Kevin because I've gotten very similar feedback on mm. my deck. People are like, this is the friend who like calls you out <laughs> because they love you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's how my friends describe me. <laughs> so it's very interesting to hear you say that. I don't think I'm that person. Oh, I don't think I used to be that person. I think I am now. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I went through something that I needed to. Right. <laughs> I just feel I've gotten a lot of feedback that my deck and I have the same personality. That's amazing. Love. Yeah. I actually, uh, when so I fun. did my introduction uh, reading with Botanica, uh, one of the prompts was, uh, what are the limitations of this deck? And what I drew was my own significator. And I was like, yeah, I know. Oh, I know. I know I'm the, I, <laughs> I know I'm my own limitations here. Like I was, I was so, gobsmacked by it. I was like, that was very rude. <laughs> oh, that actually makes me so curious. Like, which card in everyone's deck is yours? Mine is the Knight of Cups. Ooh. Ooh. With oh, very romantic. <laughs> I'm a dreamer. <laughs> what about you? The Two of Pentacles, because I'm always like, ah. That's <laughs> Uh, mine shifts between the Page of Wands and the Three of Swords, which oh, I know wow. is such a bummer card. But like, <laughs> no, like as an emo kid at heart, yeah, mine yeah, is the yeah. Three of Swords. I, just, I, just, yeah. I just love a solid bummer. Yeah, <laughs> you can get real sad about it. Um, mine is corn. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 let me, let, me, let me find corn. <laughs> it's corn. I mean, corn. corn. 
Yeah, no, no, no. I, I see it. <laughs> but also Bravo. it's saying Perfect. like <laughs> slow down before you make decisions, like listen and then reflect and then you can pop. <laughs> but that one's definitely That's amazing. I love it. Yeah, and talking about sort of how those messages are delivered uh, reminds me of one of the, the sayings about tarot that really hit home and thus I frequently repeat is that having a deck that doesn't quite land with you is like having a therapist who doesn't really understand you. <laughs> and so, yeah, you're going to get information and if it's delivered in a framework that's not familiar, you're like, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Please, I will immediately disregard this. Yeah, so. yeah. I, yeah. I loved the... Um, um, question that involved like seeing ghosts while you're or feeling ghost experiences while you're doing tarot. I think there's something that happens whenever you're like asking for feedback from the universe where it kind of like opens mm. up for whether it's ghosts or like new ways of thinking about something. I, I love that every time I sit down with any of these decks, it's like, okay, I'm opening it up. I'll be ready to listen to your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're a ghost or like <laughs> my own <laughs> sad opinion or whatever. Amazing. So I think we actually have some folks lined up here. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to see beyond where, uh, where that was. So um, let's take a question from over on this side. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I was wondering what kind of research you did to prepare for making the cards, because I know there's like such a broad interpretation of uh, what each of the cards could mean, but um, it, it, you, yeah, so what did you look into? What were you looking at to figure out the meanings of the cards and everything? Um, for me, I used three different uh, tarot books. Um, the deck I used to use um, since I was a teenager is the Herbal Tarot, mm. um, fittingly. Um, and, uh, but then I also looked at, um, oh gosh, what is her name? Edith something. It's like a book in the 60s um, that has a bunch of interpretations. And then I also read a huge tome that was all about um, Pamela Coleman Smith's original interpretations of tarot, like a lot of the symbolism that she drew from when she was making it. Um, and then beyond that, I was very lucky while I was living in England to be able to um, go to the rare books room and uh, at the British Library and read um, Herbal, uh, John Gerard's Herbal. Um, they literally handed me, it's a two huge hardcover books that were printed in 1597 that wow. a librarian just yeah. handed to me like it was nothing. And I was <laughs> like, should I wear gloves? Should I? <laughs> they have special um, holders so it doesn't break the spine. It's like an angled holder. And um, for weeks, I read this man's wild interpretations of um, largely very wrong information about plants, including things like <laughs> Um, castor bean being a panacea and not um, ricin. Um, I was like, no, don't do that. He was like, it's a cure-all. And I was like, if you consider death a cure-all, then yes, um, a painful death. Um, but I did, I love to read that. And I also read a, a bunch of books on Victorian flower language to, um, I got really into the weeds on this. <laughs> Okay, I, I read a lot of books. <laughs> I, I, um, I think my favorites were 28 Degrees of Wisdom by mm. Rachel Pollock, um, Modern Tarot by Michelle T, and then Kitchen Table Tarot by Melissa Sanova. Um, I also looked at a lot, of, a lot of other people's decks. I like made a Pinterest board for each major. <laughs> oh, cool. And then I had a, I had a friend who um, invited everyone over once a month and we'd do readings for each other and like we would all just watch the readings. It was very exhibitionist. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but I learned so much just from like reading with other people and then when I had my guidebook, when I had my guidebook done, they all like read it over and gave me feedback. That's cool. and it was really nice. I was really lucky how many people were willing to to help me and teach me and yeah. I actually made the deck sort of to teach myself how to read tarot because I was like, oh, it's like a little school project. I'll just draw a card and it'll be casual and it won't turn into 78, 78 cards and a Kickstarter later. and a career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. how it starts. I mean, 
same. I also made the deck as kind of like a, I would like to learn this, and yeah. now I have yeah. like little notes in everything. And it escalates. Kind of, and it escalates, oh, yeah. and now you're people. like, oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I looked at a lot of other decks. I also read Modern Tarot. I love that okay. book. And um, yeah, but mostly, you know, start the Wikipedia page, you kind of read all their footnotes and you kind of keep on going. And yeah. before you know it, you're like, I have, how do I summarize this into three words? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. How are we doing on time? Do we? We've got, I think we got we the got five. five. We earlier. got the five. All right. Thank you. The lights. It's a challenge. <laughs> Thanks. So let's do one more question and then we will wrap up. Um, you've been waiting for a while. Thank you. Um, hi, I am a lawyer slash intuitive card reader slash Reiki energy healer. So talk about melding worlds and different <laughs> aspects. Um, but I'm also creating my own um, multimedia, mixed media Oracle deck. Um, and I've hit a roadblock. So I wanted to know from all of you as you're going through this process, if you hit that part, I know you talked about some of the cards that were hard, but if you hit a part in the process where you're like, like I'm, I'm mid guidebook, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can listen to you anymore, universe. <laughs> now what? <laughs> so. Are you going chronologically? I am going intuitively. So okay. it is um, as it comes. And your roadblock is about like finishing the series? Yes. Or about a specific card? It's about finishing, it's about finishing, period. And how far, <laughs> how far are you into it? Um, like 50 cards. Oh, oh, wow. So yeah. close. Oh, you're, yeah. so you're close. over the hump. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I feel like anytime someone has asked me about making a deck, I usually say, start with the majors. It's what I did. Um, it'll, you could do what I did and just sell the majors if you really wanted, but... Um, I, give, I say the opposite thing. Yeah. <gasps> really? <laughs> yeah. I say start with the minors because you're going to get better at art. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now that is true, though. <laughs> <laughs> And you don't want the majors to be the least pretty. I, the way I, I did that by having the majors be the only ones that are just plants. Amazing. And I, that was my interpretation. But you should definitely continue. If you're at 50 cards, I think you should maybe take a break and think about like what excited you about making a deck in the first place. And then don't work on the card that you picked intuitively draw another card and see like what in that really sparks something interesting. There's a nice episode of Hidden Brain. It's a more recent one about getting past like writers and artists block. I, I could paraphrase phrase the advice in that, but I'd rather just recommend it. Yeah, I, I had a very chaotic way of doing this and that's where like project manager brain was definitely leading me through like the last 30 cards because mm. I would just, I had a deck and I would just pull five cards from that deck and those would be the next five cards that I would have to paint, no matter what they were. Oh. So, cool. uh, so by the time I got to the end, it was just like, cool. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I just, I'm just gonna make these. Um, but that way, you know, it was actually kind of cool because then there were some sort of treats in the in the final yeah. ones because I really just left it up to fate in terms of card order. That's cool. I'd say it's really important to know that you're gonna get to share it. So mm. I remember when I was redoing this deck, I was like, I'm going to try and go to SPX. And like, that's going to be like three months before that is my like, let's get it printed. Let's really do it. Um, but even if it's not that, if you like plan a night with some of your friends to be like, let's all do my spirit deck together or Oracle deck, um, that could give like a kind of a, a loving way to keep doing all the cards, knowing that they're going to be played with and used and read. Definitely. Yeah, that's great. That's deadlines. Really cool. deadlines. We love <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> They're magical. <laughs> that's where the lawyer intersects, where the project manager lawyer part is. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Good luck. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, those are great questions. Thanks, everyone. So it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, how about, let's start with Kevin and just tell folks about where they can find you specifically at SPX and anything cool that you have coming up we should keep our eye on. Um, I will be leaving the show right after this, oh. <laughs> unfortunately. But my publisher is here at um, L1 and 2 Beehive Books. Um, and yes, I, I'm at Kevin J. Stanton. Um, I have currently been posting all of uh, the majors, which I've turned into enamel pins, which are also for sale. 
Um, so you can like wear a little three card reading, which I love. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I post a lot of um, plant stuff. My stories are always flowers I'm growing. So um, I'm yeah. very envious of your garden. Yeah, I do not have. <laughs> oh, it skills. looks like a mess behind the camera, but you don't need. <laughs> you don't need to know that. <laughs> Um, I'm Isabella. Um, I have the self-published version of my deck at the table, but there's also a published version by Liminal 11, and that's the one you can find online. Um, my next thing hasn't been announced yet, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm doing a Lenormand deck, and I'm very excited, and it's this might hurt Lenormand, so it's like all in the same world, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Nice. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Shingen Kaur. I'm at table W70, which is kind of up against the wall with this tarot deck for like the first time ever. It like got off a boat a week ago, got shipped over. Um, if you crowdfunded it, it'll be getting shipped in like two weeks, I promise. Thank you. Um, so I'm really excited. They'll be online in like, I don't know, six weeks or so. Um, and I also have, I'm handing out free fortune cards. Uh, from an earlier deck that I did, so come on by, and I'm also on Instagram and Blue Sky Asada Spear, where I'm not posting an awful lot about cards right now. It's mostly like my dog and an obsession <laughs> over marionettes and some tables I built, but you know, it's all it's all kind of part of this deal. <laughs> um, I'm Coco Fox. Uh, when you enter SPX, I'm like, if you go to the end and you go left, so it's like. I'm W34, and I'm doing readings uh, at my table, like one card readings, uh, and I have an email list, and you get some free phone backgrounds when you sign up. So that's the easiest way to stay in touch, or Instagram, of course. I uh, forgot to tell you my table number. Oh yeah, table number. It's J4. And I, if I could say, yeah. also, yes, uh, next year, hopefully in the spring, um, we will be launching Botanica Full Bloom, a fully repackaged deck that will also include 33 cards, bringing it up to a special number of 111 oh God, uh, for so the total tide, because I'm a madman. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. Yeah. <laughs> they said, do you want to do a few more? And I said, what if I did three new suits? <laughs> they're like, okay. Wild. Yeah. I love it. Thank you all so much. Thank You're you for amazing. Having us. I'm so excited that we were able to get together. We will see you out on the floor. See you on the Thank floor. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.